mermaids. They didn't start with Disney or Hans Christian Andersen, nor were they creations by pirates seeing the deep blue sea, and they didn't originate with the Greeks being called sirens. Yeah, merfolk are ancient history. In fact, our first merman appearance happened maybe over 6,500 years ago. Mermaids are a tad more recent. Most would agree that Atargatus is the oldest mermaid folktale mythological figure in human history, at least from what we know. The name Atargatus has mostly unknown origins. People still fight about this. Some say that she might be the continuation of some of the Bronze Age Canaanite goddesses. Examples would be Astarte and Anat, and maybe even Ashura. Or she was worshipped simultaneously amongst these Bronze Age goddesses and became more popular in classical antiquity, but she might have been worshipped for over 1500 years. Not only are some of the names similar, like Astarte and Anat for sure linguistically can create Atargatus, but she does take on some traits and characteristics of Astarte, Anat, and Ashura. How each goddess ends up conflating over the course of history is still up for debate. What we do know is that Atargatus' prevalence was during classical antiquity. She was the big goddess of northern Syria at the time. Her chief sanctuary was at Heropolis, which is kind of northeast of Aleppo. She was worshipped mostly there. The Greeks would call her Derseto, and you'll see her name in some of the writing in ancient Greek myths. And then we also have her name in Roman mythology. They would often just call her the, quote, Syrian goddess. Atargatus has been a really fun one to research because there is still quite a bit of controversy surrounding her. Not only do scholars not agree on her origins, but one of the bigger issues is how she conflates. So a lot of people, especially some of the ancient Roman and Greek authors, have compared her to Hera, and we will go over this a little bit later in this video. But we also have some comparisons to Aphrodite. And then we're, we even have smaller circles that might say she's similar to Artemis, etc. So, and some people just think that she eventually just died out, like a lot of the Roman gods and goddesses did over time. But you know what? Why don't you and I go a little further and see what's up? Let's get into why you're actually here. So why is she defined as a mermaid? Or how did she turn into a fish lady? We have a few legends here. The first one is that the goddess actually descended from the heavens in the form of an egg. She was placed in the water who was then guided or even pushed by fish to the shore. This is where doves actually came into play. They incubated the egg and Atargatus emerged as a fish woman or a mermaid. We have another story where she appears as just a regular goddess. She's, she doesn't have fins. Atargatus falls in love with a beautiful mortal man and they end up having a daughter. As a result of either shame or because she accidentally kills him, she throws herself in a lake that's near Ashkelon. But here's the thing, she was quote, cursed with eternal beauty and youth. So she couldn't actually fully turn into a fish. So now she becomes half and half. In fact, this myth is a big deal because the daughter that was conceived by the mortal man and Atargatus, her name is Semiramis. And she is actually allegedly the one of the legendary queens of Syria. As a form of worship and honor of Atargatus, the ancient Syrians refused to eat fish or doves. This is because those were sacred animals to Atargatus. Many temples dedicated to Atargatus had fish ponds that only her priests were able to handle. There were also places where doves could roost in sacred trees. As time moves forward, think ancient Rome. Priests who worshipped Atargatus served an image of her with a fish tail, so she does evolve to be somewhat more related to water and fish. 
These priests also were very, very dedicated. And this is especially so according to one famous novelist and satirist, Lucian. So Lucian, he wasn't really a fan of religious practices or religion generally, and you can definitely tell in the way that he describes some of the priests who worshipped Adergatus. What he says, and unfortunately we have a few texts to draw from to get like the true image of these priests, but his was pretty prevalent. What he says is that priests of Adergatus, they would decorate themselves in this vibrant clothing and very colorful makeup. Something they would also do is they would starve themselves unless that they were received food from people as donation. And a lot of the times they would even mutilate themselves until they bled. This is definitely a more bastardized version of what Lucian's description is, but there you go. To show their dedication even further, there's a myth that actually is associated with a true practice over time. So we have an Assyrian queen who sees the vision of Adergatus, and she was told that she had to build a temple to her. The king decides to send the queen and a young man to do this task. But <laughs> here's the thing. The queen has a bit of a reputation. Uh, she really likes the dudes. She is insatiable. And the young man knows this. So what he does is he decides to castrate himself and leave his genitals in a box with the king as insurance. Like, hey, there's no way she's going to want to sleep with me. So please don't kill me, king. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> the queen still falls in love with him, madly in love. So instead, the king decides to have this compromise. He's like, all right, so I'm not going to sentence you to death, but you will be a priest for Adergatus instead, and you will stay at the temple that is being built and get away from my wife. So what happens, though, is for a very, very long time, priests did practice castration in the temple, and allegedly it is because of this myth. Over the course of history, we have had a lot of debate over how Adergatus has conflated with other goddesses. Did she conflate with Hera? Was it Rhea? Was it Aphrodite, Venus, etc.? Was it all of them? And we could probably talk about that on a totally separate video altogether. But basically, all we need to talk about is that Adergatus is one of the most well known earliest forms of a mermaid in mythology and folk tales. She also rules over many, many domains and has actually been featured in a lot of different art and artifacts in history and archaeological finds. Something that's really interesting about Adergatus is that maybe she didn't start as a mermaid. There's a lot of art out there and statues, sculptures that feature Adergatus sitting on a throne guarded by two lions. This is really similar to goddesses Ishtar and Inanna. She carries a scepter and wears a mural crown. Not only that, sometimes she's featured holding sheaves of grain. You'll see her with her consort, who's Hadad, in a lot of places, which is funny because there's not a lot of stories that talk about how they got together. So Hadad is also known as Baal, and he is the ancient storm and rain god. This is why people argue about this, because they're like, oh, she has to be Hera because her consort is clearly somebody who's conflated with Zeus. Anyway. That's a different time, and you can find more about that in the description down below. The worship of Adergatus spread all across the Mediterranean, and this is mostly because of Syrian slaves, so her story and worship, mercenaries, traitors, etc. So that's why she is so prevalent in Greek and Roman mythology. She was very well known as the goddess of the Syrians for both of the Greeks and the Romans. In fact, it became so prevalent in Roman mythology that it is said that Adergatus is actually Venus, who is Jupiter's consort. 
Adrigaeus has quite a few domains that she rules over, and this is over the course of hundreds if not thousands of years. She is a fertility goddess. She is also the all-mother goddess, especially when it comes to the ancient Syrians. Her sacred animals tend to be fish and doves, and she is shown with lions, but both fish and doves are actually associated with love and creation, which she is very, very, and desirability. Those are things that she's very well known for. She is very closely related to the fish, and sometimes she has been represented in the form of a mermaid, being like half female, half fish, and that looks different in various ways. So even though we had the Greeks, who decided to create the sirens, and many people think that maybe the sirens were the first forms of what mermaids might have looked like. I still think that Adrogatus probably takes the cake. There's probably myths out there that maybe we just don't know about because they have been written down of mermaids from way in prehistoric times. I wouldn't be surprised. But for now, I'm gonna say that Adrogatus is gonna take the throne. She is definitely the goddess and the first of mermaids. And that's it for Adrogatus. But wait, there are a ton of other art and drawing videos here on this channel. Don't stop, keep learning. If you like videos like these, give me a thumbs up, comment, let me know what kind of gods and goddesses you're into right now.